Senator Hawley, you're recognized for your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to the nominees for being here. Congratulations on your nominations. Mr. Rivez, if I could start with you, I want to come back to President Biden's memorandum issuing priorities for OIRA back from January 20th, 2021. Those included addressing, I'm quoting now, systemic racial inequality and the undeniable reality and accelerating threat of climate change. I want to start with that second one first, if I could. You've dedicated a substantial part of your career to working on environmental issues. Uh, you've written, I think, a series of books and articles, other publications on environmental matters, including environmental law and policy, struggling for air, power plants, and the war on coal, environmental uh, law and policy, second edition, the globalization of cost-benefit analysis in environmental policy, air pollution and environmental justice, the social cost of greenhouse gases, and destabilizing environmental regulation, the Trump administration's concerted attack on regulatory analysis. So I think, I think it's fair to say this is, a, this is a deep interest of yours. Is that fair? It is, Senator. And you are also, I think, the faculty director for a time, uh, for a number of years, actually, uh, for the Program on Environmental Regulation. It, that's, that's right, isn't it? Yes, it actually became the Institute of Policy Integrity, but I have led those programs for a long time. Yeah, no, very good. So I want to ask you about one of the most uh, significant environmental rules of the last decade, which is the Obama-era Waters of the United States rule. I'm sure you're familiar with that rule. I'm familiar with the rule, Senator. It, it, tell me what your, your view on it is. Did you agree with the rule at the time that it was issued in 2015? Senator, I have actually not done as much work on water as I have done on air, uh, but based on my, so my, you know, I wouldn't say I have deep expertise on the on issues surrounding that rule, but um, in general, um, I, I agree that uh, waters of the United States definition needed to be clarified, and I thought that the Obama administration had done a good job attempting to clarify it. So you think that EPA had the authority, the legal authority to expand the definition of waters of the United States in the way they did in the rule? Uh, at the time, Senator, I, I thought they did. Uh, there have been intervening uh, judicial decisions, um, and we may be in a different place, but at the time that that regulation was, uh, was promulgated, I thought the Obama administration had that authority. You say that, that uh, there have been intervening decisions and now we're maybe in a different place. Explain that to me. What do you think? Uh, well, I have not followed those decisions closely, Senator, um, and so I can give you, um, you know, a, a full answer, but I, I know that the courts have been, um, uh, have been issuing decisions in this area, and if, obviously, if I was in the OIRA position when uh, a proposal uh, involving uh, a a um, revision of that regulation came before me, I would seek to um, get up to speed on where things stand. As it's likely to do, correct? Well, I don't know what the timing is, and I don't know whether I'll get confirmed for this position. <laughs> well, the, I'm sure you do know that the administration has proposed a, a substantial revision and extension of the Waters of the United States rule. The comment period on it, I think, is closed, and so if you are confirmed, you're, you're likely to see it for OIRA review. Uh, I guess my next question would be, will you will you weigh carefully the interest in having a safe and reliable food supply in the United States, the livelihood of farmers and ranchers who depend on access to their land, use of the waters in their land, will, will that weigh in your cost benefit analysis? It, it definitely will. I mean, all, you know, from my perspective, again, as I, as I indicated, I don't think there is, you know, there shouldn't be the cost benefit analysis of this administration or that administration. This is a, uh, an academic discipline, is a professional discipline with professional norms. And all effects, uh, whoever they, whoever bears those consequences, and whether they're positive or negative, all that has to be accounted for. And a properly conducted cost-benefit analysis would do that, Senator. But just to come back to the to my first question and to the main issue, it's your legal opinion as a, as a as an expert on environmental law that the EPA did have the authority, at least in 2015, to define transitory bodies of water like ditches filled with rain, as waters of the United States under Supreme Court precedent? It was my view then, Senator, and I have not um, rethought this issue since then and have not, and I'm not completely up to speed with all the intervening decisions. Well, I have to say I find that disturbing. I mean, as, as the Attorney General of Missouri, I was one of the states that sued the Obama administration uh, and, uh, and then uh, continued that suit into the Trump administration in order to get that rule repealed precisely because uh, 
I, my review of the case law is, and I think that subsequent courts have agreed, that the EPA was substantially outside of its jurisdiction in expanding the definition in that manner. And I have to tell you that the effect, the real world effect, on farmers and ranchers in the state of Missouri is little short of catastrophic, which is why you saw so many groups of farmers and ranchers, and I might just add, particularly small farmers and ranchers. You know, corporate interests are one thing. They can absorb the cost of these regulations. But when we're talking about family farms and family ranchers, the cost of complying with these draconian regulations that, frankly, I think are unauthorized by law or case law, statutory law or case law, is, is it truly, I mean, it's crushing, truly, truly crushing. So I have to say that that worries me, and this will be something that you'll be looking at. Let me ask you about another set of interests. Um, the the, the uh, Biden uh, executive order talked about uh, accelerating climate change and racial inequality. Do you think cost-benefit analysis should also consider harms like religious liberties? Uh, yes, Senator. I think cost-benefit analysis should consider impacts on any individuals who feel an impact. Um, and actually, for example, the, the, the Obama uh, Executive Order 13563 talks about human dignity as one of the factors that should be considered. Um, and I consider religious liberty to be part and parcel of human dignity. Good. So, so let me just ask you, how would you evaluate the costs and benefits of a regulation like OSHA's vaccine mandate that was for employers that was struck down by the court in the NFIB case uh, earlier, earlier this year. Did you support that rule at the time, the OSHA rule at the time it was issued? I, I did not do any professional work on that rule. So. Did you have a professional opinion on it? I did not have a, pro I mean, I, I, I just, you know, I, I, I try to stay in my lane. I, I express views when I have studied things. Um, and I had not studied that issue. Well, let me ask you then to, to walk through how you'd evaluate the, the cost and benefits of a regulation like that one, where you have very significant religious liberty concerns on one side of the ledger. Give us a sense of your thinking. Right. So I, I think those are cognizable uh, consequences that should be evaluated. Now, you know, as you know, not every cognizable consequence can be quantified and monetized because the techniques for doing that are not there. Uh, unquantified benefits should be taken into account in a well-conducted cost-benefit analysis, and actually the executive orders and OMB Circle A4 uh, provide for that and say that should happen. Uh, exactly how they get weighed against quantified um, uh, consequences is difficult, um, and th th there's no like cookbook approach to doing that, but, but that what, that's what makes it um, an important and challenging endeavor. And I would try to do this as, as, as well as could be done, uh, taking advantage of any um, economic uh, and other work, uh, thinking through these issues. Um, and at the end of the day, um, qualitative judgments need to be made, as they need to be made with respect to other unquantified benefits as well. Well, my time has expired, and I know that there are other senators who are waiting to question, so I'll have some more questions probably for the record and for you as well, Mr. Schreiber. I would just say, Mr. Rivez, in your case, I think we have seen in the first two uh, years of this, not quite two years of, of this uh, administration, uh, some, some truly outrageous and outlandish regulations uh, that have not survived court review. And, and the OSHA mandate is one of them, but there are others. I would hope, if you're confirmed, that you would be a check on these, frankly, sometimes the illegal and unconstitutional actions and that you would commit to this committee that you will be, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say you think it ought to be nonpartisan, this sort of review. And uh, I hope that you would be a nonpartisan and neutral check. And given your long background uh, in the law, your, your very distinguished record in the law, I hope that you would be someone who would stand for the rule of law against what I think, frankly, have been some outrageous actions by this administration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.